Okay, Chair, we're now live streaming. When you're ready, would you like to start the meeting? Thank you very much, Wendy. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the East Devon District Council's Virtual Strategic Planning Committee meeting on the 23rd of February, 2021. I'm your Chair, Councillor Dan Ledger. I would also like to welcome anyone watching this meeting via the live stream. All participants here uh, today are taking part remotely, and as well as being live streamed, the meeting has been recorded. So please bear this in mind throughout and be careful with your language. May I also remind members that the code of conduct uh, applies throughout the meeting and we reserve the right to remove and disconnect any participant who disrupts the meeting by whatever means. As the strategic planning committee meeting is depending on an internet, connection, uh, an internet connection and a power supply, in the event of a break in the connection or a power cut, please bear with, with us as we try to reconnect. After 15 minutes, if we are not able to reconnect, we will consider this meeting adjourned and reconvene at a later date. Please check the committee page website uh, on our website for details. Please make sure all phones are switched off uh, or are on silent and make sure all microphones are muted when you're not speaking to avoid any background noise levels. Please do not interrupt during the meeting. Keep your points short and try not to repeat shorts, uh, points made that have already been made. If you wish to comment, please raise your electronic blue hand and wait to be, wait to be called. All councillors have been sent the agenda for today's meeting. Any member of the public who wants to view the agenda can do so by visiting our website, eastdevon.gov.uk. We'll now start the meeting by doing a roll call of committee members here present. Can you please now unmute your microphones and when you hear your name, please confirm by saying present. When you've confirmed you're present, please then remute your microphone. Over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Chair. I'll start with you, so Councillor Ledger. Present. Thank you. Councillor Davy. Present. Thank you. Can I just check that your, your green ticks and your red crosses work now, Councillor Davy, if you've managed to update your system? Is that showing? It is. Brilliant. Thank you very Good. much. It's done something very strange to my camera, I'm afraid. So <laughs> I've gone widescreen or something. I'll, I'll uh, have a fiddle with it to see if it helps. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Blakey. Present, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Hookway. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Present. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Ingham. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Present. Thank you. Councillor Rylance. Present. Thank you. Councillor Skinner. Councillor Thomas. Present. Thank you. I can confirm we're core today. Thanks very much, Wendy. So we'll start with the agenda. So agenda item number one is public speaking. There are no members of the public wishing to speak. Is that correct, Wendy? That is correct, yes. Thank you. So agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting. Um, if anyone has any comments, can you raise your, your hand? And Councillor Ellen Rylance. Thank you, Chair. It was just a small typo. It says 30th hectares rather than 30 hectares somewhere. Can't quite remember where. Um, in the It's on page four, the top of page four, where it says the chapters four and eight consultative document. Partway down that um, our paragraph, it says 30th hectares of land. I mean, it's, it's a small typo, but it would be more comprehensible to outsiders with that taken up. Thanks very much. So with that small amendment, is everyone else happy to approve those minutes? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three are apologies. We've received apologies from Councillor Allen. Thanks very much, Wendy. Uh, agenda item number four are uh, declarations of interest. We'll be doing this via a roll call again. Thank you, Chair. So um, I'll start with you, please. None. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Uh, town Council member for Exmouth Town Council. Thank you. Councillor Arnott. 
Uh, no interest, thank you. Councillor Blakey. None, thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Councillor Chamberlain. Uh, no, I don't think Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hayward. Uh, yes, uh, personal interest uh, in items 7, 8 and 12, just through the nature of my employment with the usual three parish councils. Thank you, Wendy. Councillor Hayward, just for the um, for live stream viewers watching online, could you just um, just say your parish councils that you work for? Of course, yes. Uh, All Saints Parish Council and Chardstock Parish Council, both of which are in the uh, Axe Nutrient uh, Management Plan area. Uh, both of them also receive uh, potentially Section 106 and SIL uh, monies. Um, and also Newton Popperford Parish Council, which isn't in the um, Ax Nutrient Plan, but also receives Section 106 and SIL payments. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Councillor Hookway. Uh, none, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Howe. Yes, uh, Member of Bishop's Cliffs Parish Council, Cliffs St Mary, regarding item 8, Section 106 of Community Infrastructure Levy. Item eight, lovely, thank you. Councillor Ingham. No. Thank you. Councillor Moulding. Uh, on item 10, the East Devon playing pitch strategy, I am president of Cloakham Lawn Sports Centre, which has football and cricket pitches. Thank you. Councillor Rylance. Thank you, Wendy. I think probably um, items eight, nine and 11, um, uh, by way of being a par Brooklyn's parish councillor and resident of the so-called West End of East Devon. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. And finally, Councillor Thomas. I don't know if it's relevant or not, Wendy, but just to confirm that I'm a member of Uplime and Lime Regis Cricket Club. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Wendy. So agenda item number five are uh, matters of urgency. Uh, I can confirm that there are no matters of urgency. Uh, agenda item six, confidential and exempt items. I can again confirm that there are no co confidential or exempt items. So then moving on to the main part of the agenda, agenda item seven is the River Axe Nutrient Management Plan. And we have Ed Freeman to present a report. Over to you, Ed. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so the River Axe Nutrient Management Plan comes about off the back of the adopted local plan um, where Natural England raised concerns about water quality in the Axe, um, which as you note from the report is recorded as unfavourable declining. Um, this is particularly significant because the River Axe is a triple SI, uh, site of special scientific interest and an area of special uh, conservation. Um, it um, supports important vegetation types and uh, significant fish species um, and is adversely affected by high concentrations of phosphates in the river. Um, although obviously phosphates are naturally occurring and are indeed essential nutrients for plant growth, in high concentrations they can lead to excessive growth of algae and depletion of oxygen to the detriment of the habitat. So as a res and this, this arises primarily from uh, runoff from uh, agricultural activities, from farm animal waste fertilizers, which manages to reach the water course through surface water runoff, um, but also as a result of uh, sewage discharge from residences within the catchment area. Uh, while sewage treatment facilities help to address this issue, they don't um, completely address the impacts. And so we end up with higher phosphate levels reaching the river course, the water course, than uh, is, is uh, acceptable. Um, and hence this uh, deteriorating water quality issue. Uh, so the plan before you seeks to examine these issues in further detail and seeks to establish a methodology for calculating the impacts of development on this issue um, and the potential mitigation that could be applied to address these issues. Um, so this will be particularly necessary for large scale new developments coming forward within the area. And indeed, this is particularly highlighted in the adopted local plan in relation to the urban extension proposed uh, for Axminster. Um, 
so it's, as I say, it's a key evidence in terms of supporting the delivery of that site and other large scale developments within the acts, but also looking ahead towards the next local plan, which obviously we're starting to, to uh, prepare for. This could be a key evidence document in terms of um, the area around Axminster and the acts. Uh, in terms of understanding um, the mitigation that would be needed to enable growth to come forward in that area. Um, in terms of mitigation, this can take sort of three different forms. Uh, some mitigation is on site, so it would be part of the development proposal itself and could take the form of an on site sewage treatment plant or water efficiency measures to reduce the amount of discharge into the water course. They could be catchment measures where um, it's in the form of creation of wetlands within the catchment of the axe, tree planting measures in, in the catchment area, or potentially changes in agricultural practices. So um, over a number of years now, the Environment Agency and Natural England have been working with uh, farms uh, within the area to try and reduce runoff um, in terms of, you may have seen planning applications to cover over farm yards and things like this, to try and capture surface water runoff so that it doesn't flow through uh, farm waste on, on the site or pick up fertilizers um, as it flows across the, the site and into the watercourses. So those sorts of measures um, could be taken forward further. And then obviously there's uh, the additional option through the sewage undertakers of upgrading sewage treatment facilities as well. Um, so we're currently working with various different bodies to, to try and address these uh, mitigation issues, particularly with the East Devon Catchment Partnership and the Axe Catchment Partnership in relation to the catchment measures that I, I mentioned and how we can work with farm owners and other landowners in the area to try and deliver um, mitigation that could potentially be funded by financial contributions from developments coming forward in the area. Uh, so this work is, is ongoing, but in the meantime, uh, we're just seeking to bring this report for members' attention so that there's wide awareness of the issues and asking members to note the work that's been going on, endorse the plan as a key evidence document, um, but also note it as a material consideration for future planning applications coming forward in that area. Thank you. Thanks very much. Does any non-member wish to speak at this time? Councillor Marianne Rickson, you're up first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my concern is uh, obviously about the impact this is going to have on the environment of the river. And um, in 4.3, it talks about sufficient mitigation um, to ensure that the Axminster Urban Extension could be delivered. But surely what is needed is not just to um, to contain it and ensure sufficient mitigation. What you need is a significant reduction in the phosphate levels, particularly as the river, river is already described as unfavorable declining. Uh, there was a report today from the BBC, uh, which was regarding, um, uh, regarding a catastrophic decline in freshwater fish. And apparently two species of fish have already vanished. That's the sturgeon and burbot salmon are disappearing and the European eel remains critically endangered. According to the World Wildlife Fund, much of the decline is driven by the poor state of rivers, mostly as a result of pollution, dams and sewage, the sort of issues that we're already talking about here. So the question is, which fish and other creatures will be next, unless or until this is really addressed? And I really mean in order to improve the quality of the river significantly, which is what is actually required here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor Rickson. We'll take a few more speakers and then we'll come uh, back to Ed Freeman, just answer all the questions all in one. So Councillor Jeff Young next. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> I welcome the report, um, but that's what it is, just a report. Um, all our watercourses um, in this area are heavy, heavily polluted, uh, but uh, the importance of the X is critical, uh, especially with the Seaton wetlands um, uh, and uh, the, the bathing waters at, um, at Seaton. Uh, this report is to deliver extra development, it seems, uh, but my view is that we should um, get started on doing something uh, to improve the uh, water quality of the X 
um, with all the parties. Um, um, it, it does include uh, other uh, county councils. It does in, uh, involve um, the Blackdown Hills. Um, it's um, a major watercourse uh, with lots of tributaries and we could do a lot to learn uh, and to improve this uh, watercourse. Uh, but this report um, may be in the step right direction, but I'd like to see a lot more steps being taken uh, very quickly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Young. Councillor Ian Hall next. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, we, we absolutely need clean water in the River Act so that the uh, system can thrive. It is a wonderful, wonderful river and literally has potential impacts downstream if we are not able to negate this on any development site. And as an example, we know that the very successful seat and wetland reserve is absolutely imperative and something to be proud of. But this has to, in my opinion, need to be negated on site um, so it doesn't become an impact uh, anywhere else in the Axe Valley. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Hall. Ed Freeman, do you want to come back on any of the questions raised by the previous few speakers? Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I mean, first of all, to, to agree with the speakers really clearly, um, mitigating further impact so that the watercourse doesn't decline further is, is one thing. And really, I suppose that's our, our primary concern from a planning authority perspective is that developments that we're granting permission for or allocating through the local plan don't make the situation worse. Um, but clearly, we should be trying to improve the situation beyond that as well. Um, and I, I think, um, obviously, looking ahead to what's coming forward through the Environment Bill, which is currently going through Parliament and will hopefully become the Environment Act and introduce requirements for biodiversity net gain, it would seem that the River Axe is, is an obvious candidate for where some of those measures could be uh, accommodated if we were, for example, collecting contributions from developments across the wider district to a wider biodiversity net gain strategy, how monies could potentially be used in this area where there are clear opportunities for net gain within the acts by improving the water quality. And we're already some way to identifying what those measures might be um, and potentially delivering things like um, additional wetland areas um, within the axe catchment, which, which could help with that. So I think it's about joining up this from a planning perspective, as I say, which is about new developments coming forward and mitigating those impacts with wider work we're doing as a council on biodiversity net gain, um, rewilding, for example, our climate change agenda to try and ensure that those um, projects will work together to try and deliver the maximum benefits, including in overall improving water quality within the acts. Um, the other thing to say on that is, is that it's not that nothing has been happening. As, as I said, um, Natural England and the Environment Agency, I know, have been providing grants over the last five or six years uh, to farmers within the area to try and help them improve working practices to cover over farmyards and things to stop water runoff capturing uh, waste within their yards etc and that work is as I understand it continuing um, and has already started to see some some benefits so there's there's a wider uh, area of work going on beyond uh, our own remit um, but obviously working with those bodies to see how we can help and deliver that strategy um, has to be part of our approach moving forward I think. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, it's really welcome. Um, I seem to have lost all, all the hands that were raised, I know that Councillor Rylands did have a hand up um, but could all those members re-raise their hands please? Um, so if there's no other outside speakers left, we'll, we'll move to Councillor Rylands next. Thank you, Chair. I, I suppose I'm slightly disturbed by the notion that water quality in a river in 2021 is declining. Um, and and so, uh, uh, by your report, largely due to farming practices, because I thought that um, the, the vectors for, for um, extreme pollution events are quite well understood now by farmers. Um, and I certainly see my neighbours um, you know, spreading their slurry and managing their runoff in very responsible ways. And I'm wondering um, what's, whether there's anything in particular about the River Axe, maybe it's the, the steep escarpments running down into it, um, that are actually contributing more to this. I mean, we, we know from um, 
from spillage events in the United States quite how damaging um, spread, you know, spillages of slurry can be into river courses. Um, and they can actually effectively kill a river in, in, in just one event by completely outcompeting every single, you know, pulling all the oxygen out of the water, killing all the fish and killing all the vegetation. We know that. So uh, I thought that over the last few years, we'd make quite significant inroads into encouraging farmers to farm in, in, in ways that limit pollution in rivers. So I suppose, yeah, I mean, tackling it through, partly through the planning system seems like a good idea, but I thought all the all, the, all the, the sort of methodology was already in place. And I'm wondering whether we have actually have an, in, uh, not an enforcement because that sounds a bit authoritarian, but a sort of um, uh, a, a, a checkup problem rather than anything else. Because I understand that farmers have been able to access grants and things to build um, cattle holding pen uh, roofs and put lids over their, their slurry stores and you know are heavily encouraged not to mismanage their slurry so I'm just wondering are we actually do we actually have any powers to enforce any of this because you know we can tackle it with mitigation as much as we like but if we can't stop it at source then we've got a, ma a much bigger problem than the mitigation can palliate for I mean obviously planting trees is a good thing and increasing biodiversity on the riverbank but we need to be mindful not to decrease biodiversity inside the river first. I mean, that surely should be our first focus in terms of managing the, the, the health of the river act. So can we enforce um, any of the farming practices through environmental health? Uh, what vectors specifically are we using at the moment to make sure that farmers avail themselves of the help and, and subsidies and grants available? And is there anything in particular about the river acts that makes it particularly susceptible to runoff? Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Islands. Again, we'll we'll take a few more speakers and then go back to uh, Ed Freeman. So next up is Councillor Kevin Blakey. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair. And um, it's it's expanding very slightly on uh, uh, what Eleanor has just said, and it's a question to Ed Freeman. We're, we're, this is slightly outside the agenda item, but uh, are there any other watercourses in East Devon that have been identified as having a similar a uh, problem to the acts um, or has that not been looked into? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Move on to Councillor Paul Arnold. Thank you, Chair, very much. Um, yeah, just three very quick points. Um, the first is, which, which I think perhaps goes to, you know, give information to Councillor Rance and Councillor Blakey. Uh, in my ward, um, about uh, a mile that way, um, out towards Southley, Southley Brook, um, a farmer dropped 100,000 litres of slurry in there. Um, that was 2019. So to answer the question, have we as an authority got any teeth? No. What you're hoping for is the Environment Agency in due course takes up you know, a prosecution and so forth. So that's the, that's the context, that's the agricultural context that's on my doorstep and it's happening. And this is difficult because some of my best mates are farmers and I like all the rest of it. But um, it's been very badly abused. It has as a, as, a, as a river catchment area. So that then goes to my second point, which is that unfortunately, as it stands, I think the bodies we've got looking over this are completely toothless. They have no teeth. And that then goes to the third point, which is given that we already knew this, we knew this stuff back in 2013, 14, why on earth was this not taken in consideration in the preparation of what is now the adopted local plan? Nothing has changed. The world doesn't change that quickly it hasn't suddenly become polluted since 2014-15. I do not understand why, when considering the possibility of the, you know, great potential overdevelopment of the north northeast quadrant of Axminster, why that wasn't taken in consideration then. So this does feel like uh, locking the stable door after the horse has bolted, uh, and. I don't really see, and I've been looking very carefully at the report that's come with this, and the pages that are about the future development and mitigation and so forth, um, it's not compelling at the moment. Uh, it really isn't. Um, and I think we will have to, as we develop the 
local plan moving ahead, take this much more seriously than it was taken only seven or eight years ago, when, to be honest, I do not understand why it was not taken seriously then. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnott. Ed Freeman, I think that's a good time to, to bring you in to just to answer the, the previous three speakers' questions. Whenever you're ready. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, first of all, in terms of uh, Councillor Rylance's comments, I mean, the enforcement powers, as I understand them, rest with the Environment Agency and Natural England. Um, certainly in terms of specific pollution events, um, they obviously investigate and, and take action as appropriate. I, I think it's perhaps slightly more difficult when it's um, historic agricultural practices that um, they would be um, enforcing against and then uh, specifically linking them to um, reduction in water quality from what, what could be many miles away. Um, so uh, I don't envy them that, that challenge, as I say, that they have been doing work in terms of offering grants and supporting agricultural industries in the area to try and improve. And that work is ongoing. So uh, hopefully that is obviously part of the measures moving forwards. Um, our responsibilities relate to development coming forward in the area and, and mitigating that. So that's obviously been the focus of, of this piece of work. Um, in terms of specifics of, of the acts, I'm not aware of any specific issues that, that make the acts specifically vulnerable to, to these issues, or indeed of other water courses in East Devon where these, these issues apply. Um, I suppose this issue here in terms of the acts has been specifically brought to our attention by Natural England because it is a European protected site, as I said. It's a site of special scientific interest and a site of special interest for conservation. So um, that, that makes it of particular significance in, in planning terms. Um, but there may well be issues with other uh, water courses that are, are less uh, significant, shall we say, in terms of the habitats that they support um, that aren't European designated. Um, uh, and perhaps that's a conversation we need to have with Natural England moving forward through the local plan process in terms of ensuring that we're aware of that and, and, and the impacts of our actions in terms of the local plan uh, and development uh, may have on those issues. Um, in terms of Councillor Arnott's point, in terms of the adopted local plan, I mean, this, this work has basically come about because of uh, what happened with the production of the now adopted local plan where these issues were highlighted. Um, and um, strategy 20, which is development at Axminster, does highlight this in, in the text, in the policy of, of the need to develop a nutrient management plan and, and for mitigation in terms of mitigating for new growth at Axminster, which was allocated in the plan. So this work is part of delivering that and has to some extent come about from work on revisiting the master plan for the urban extension at uh, Axminster. Um, which uh, now with the knowledge of this document can now move forward and be informed by this work and this work can also inform the next local plan as has been said. So clearly our greater understanding of these issues now can uh, help to inform that work um, moving forward, both in terms of, of the already allocated urban extension, but also looking at where growth might be located in this area in the future as well. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Um, Councillor Paul Hayward, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to touch on a couple of points that our other members have made. So um, I thank Councillor Rickson for her uh, beautifully uh, eloquent statement that it's not enough to mitigate uh, and offset. Uh, you know, that, that was perhaps the old way. Now as a, a council that is completely committed to its environmental credentials and helping to save the planet and save East Devon, we have a moral obligation to reduce. It isn't just enough to stop it in its tracks. We have to do whatever we can to reduce it and minimise it. That's a statement of fact. We can't get away from that. Um, as a case in point, I'm an Axminster resident and five or six years ago, I waded through Elite, which for those who might not know, is a little offshoot of the Axe off the Millbrook. And I was working there and a brown trout swam along and nudged my foot, spear, scared the bejesus out of me. I didn't know what it was until I saw it. Lovely, beautiful, beautiful animal. Um, I looked at that leap uh, about, about a year ago. I was there, just choked up. 
literally it's now full of weeds full of algae natural habitat for tires now nothing else i don't know what else could live in it um and that is a consequence that's a consequence of various factors but one of them is phosphates um so we need to do everything we can to stop that and improve it um you touched on the issue of the upper acts uh well as somebody who traveled or traveled before covid up and down to chard and who knows uh, Tatworth and Fortin fairly well, for one reason or another. Uh, yes, the unfettered growth in that area is a, com- is a cause of this and will perpetuate the problem and certainly will worsen it. And this comes back to a discussion that we had here about the guest, how we'd thrown all our eggs into the basket of liaising um, with those authorities. And I asked this through this forum, are we liaising with South Somerset District Council in a meaningful way? Because South Somerset District Council, the planning authority, is allowing this unexpurgated growth here. And that's having direct impact on our part of the acts, the lower acts. And you're quite right. We could do everything here. It's like, you know, us in the UK trying to say, well, we'll cut down on this, we'll cut down on that. But if the huge players in the world keep building a coal-fired power station every day, it's difficult. It, it's difficult to, to show some reductions. So we do need to work meaningfully with those authorities, specifically South Somerset, because everything they do impacts on us directly. Um, two other points. Councillor Hall touched on the issue of the wetlands. We are blessed to have that. We've won international, national awards for this incredible habitat. But if we don't do what we know we have to do, we could kill it. We could kill it. If, if phosphates increase or we simply just try and stabilise it, we could lose the wetlands. What an ecological disaster that will be. And all those people would look to us and say, why didn't you do something about it? Councillor Arnott hit the nail on the head. The time to do this, like planting trees, was 10 years ago. We are now being tasked to deal with it. And it shouldn't be in 10 years They look at us, the class of 2021, and say, you didn't do enough. Why weren't you more demonstrative? Why didn't you stand up to this sort of development and demands that we can't afford it, we can't do it? Well, we force their hand. And finally, on the issue of the uh, the master plan that uh, Mr. Freeman alluded to, so the the local plan uh, allowed for 650 homes in the master plan. It now proposes 850 And for those who've read the papers, you've got another 150 odd across the road from the entrance to the uh, northeast extension site. So that's a thousand now. So maybe you're 50 percent above what the local plan proposed. So if it was a problem for the nutrient management plan when it's 650, imagine the problem we're going to have to try and mitigate, stabilise, let alone reduce with a thousand And that can only get worse because there'll be pressures. There'll be pressures elsewhere in the district to build more. And that will mean 1,200, 1,500. We already have seen this committee within Guest consider the lower quadrant of Axminster with another many hundreds. So, you know, Axminster is the, the whipping boy here, I'm afraid. And, you know, my views on the master plan are well known. Uh, I won't go into them now. Um, But I think beyond all this, we have to be demonstrative. We have to take firm action. And perhaps mitigation isn't enough. You know, all these assessments, and I I wholeheartedly support the the recommendations that we, we, we note the work that's been done, but we must be more demonstrative. We must push back. We must push for improvements. And if we're told it can't be afforded or you've got to give something else, Perhaps the time has come to draw a line in the sand, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Hayward. The only point that I would make is uh, it wouldn't just be South Somerset, it would also be Dorset that we would need to speak to because obviously the start of the axe is just north of Leominster, I believe. It, that's very well noted, Chair. Um, for you know, driving around Dorset, they don't seem to be doing as much as South Somerset in the way of development. I haven't travelled; none of us should have travelled, actually. So, you know, we can look at it on Google Earth, I suppose, and, and uh, read the papers. Um, but in that part of the world, I'm not aware of a huge amount. But I, I'll, t- I'll, you know, stand by your your better knowledge, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Hayward. Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the bit we can mitigate is what happens when extra housing goes there. Um, But it's pretty clear 
that most of the um, nutrients going into the axe are coming from farming and that they always do. Um, and uh, in point 216, paragraph 216 of the report, it says uh, the agricultural supplies stem from the application of fertilizer in the form of manure and slurry onto fields, the risk of which is only increased by the intensive practices undertaken within the axe catchment. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear that although obviously housing is going to make a contribution, and we have to mitigate that. The main uh, producer of the phosphates is agriculture. And I wonder, you know, if Mr. Freeman, he's mentioned already a couple of things that we're doing, but I wonder how much we're doing uh, to ensure that the farmland around the axe is also playing its part um, in decreasing the amount of phosphates going into the river. And I notice in, in catchment measures, it uh, highlights quite a few things that can be done, but I wonder how much is being done and how much, as somebody said, how much teeth we've got. Um, the Environment Agency, I wonder, have there been any prosecutions um, for discharges into the acts? And are we working closely with the National Farmers Union and, and other local um, farming representatives uh, to try and improve the water quality in the acts because the housing, um, even if we make it completely neutral, we are still going to have a problem with the acts. Thanks very much, Councillor Davy. I think it states in in the report the working the working group that's already uh, been set up. Um, and it is just all about collaborative working with the, uh, the likes of the Environment Agency um, and the NFU, really. Um, I'll, I'll defer to Ed Freeman after our last speaker, but it, it might be a case that we might uh, would like to lean more on to the Environment Agency to try and see if um, they can grow a, <laughs> some longer tea. So, Councillor Andrew Moulding, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, coincidentally, I'm just rereading for about the third time the Pullman's Book of the Acts, written in the uh, 19th century and uh, purporting the beauty and cleanliness of the river. And uh, I, like Councillor Rickson, I noticed the article in the paper about the catastrophic decline in freshwater fish. My father was a very, very keen angler, and back in the 1960s, he caught the biggest roach in the country that year from the River Axe, and I doubt whether he'd be able to do that now. That's if it was alive, of course. Uh, but irrespective of development in the area, as Ollie Davy just said, the condition of the River Axe is probably just as much or even more down to uh, the agricultural practices as it is to overdevelopment. And yes, I would not disagree that there should be some cost to developers um, for mitigation against concerns with the local sewage quality. And if that means that um, uh, contributions might need to be made by developers so that the sewage works can be improved so that um, there are no leachings from the sewer works into the river. But I am sure we must be urging the Environment Agency to be doing far more work on their practices to improve the quality of the River Act. Just one question I'd like to ask Ed, and I don't think I noticed it in the report. What about the River Yarty and the River Collie, which are both tributaries of the River Axe? Are they also suffering from similar concerns as far as river quality is concerned? Thanks very much for that, Councillor Moulding. Um, we'll go to Ed Freeman and then can I push committee to look at the recommendations and start to make some proposals. So Ed Freeman, over to you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
So yes, I, I think there's been mention made of, of the working party that was set up at, at the start of all of this work. So we started off having a meeting with Natural England and the Environment Agency in Southwest Water uh, about the, the wider issues, and, and they did acknowledge at that meeting that um, you know obviously there's a, there's a wider role here, wider issues here than than simply mitigating for development coming forward in the area. Um, and that they are working on those issues. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that we are part of, of, of the puzzle here, but we're not, we don't have control over the, the big picture here. There are other agencies involved uh, and, and uh, while we can put pressure on them, we are reliant on them doing that. Um, also through this work, we did have a, a, a workshop session in which we invited um, other agencies, landowners into the discussions about this issue as well. And that included officers from South Somerset and Dorset councils. Um, so we have engaged with them. They are aware of the issues and obviously they could be part of the solution in terms of uh, a mitigation strategy to, uh, to mitigate this and beyond mitigation to deliver enhancements within uh, the catchment area as well. So there's a long way to go in terms of, of, of those discussions, um, but um, we are working with, with our partners in, in those neighbouring authorities as well as other agencies. Um, and I, I think the other thing to mention is obviously the East Evan and Blackdown Hills AOMB teams have a role in, in this as well and have good contacts with the farming community, which we're trying to utilise as well. Um, the other thing I was going to um, just mention was, uh, I think I was asked about if there are any prosecutions. Uh, I'm not aware of any, but then I wouldn't expect to be because that's under different legislation. It's outside of the, the planning process. So uh, other than anything that's been reported in the press, I wouldn't be aware of, of, of those. Um, and I think Councillor Moulding asked about the River Yarty and Collie. Um, I mean, my understanding is that the issue is within the acts. Um, but obviously the tributaries that lead to it are, are partly carrying uh, those phosphates to, to the axe. Um, so it, it may be that it's more of accumulation in, in, in the axe at the end that's causing the problem, but you'd have to think logically on that basis, there must be some fairly high phosphate levels running through the RC and Collie as well. Whether they are having impacts on the habitat there, I, I couldn't say we'd have to speak to Natural England. Um, so... Yes, there's, again, there's some wider work to be done there in terms of understanding how much of an issue it is in the tributaries and, and, and what can be done to, to mitigate that as well. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Ed. Um, so looking at the recommendations, are members happy to know or do we have other recommendations that we wish to add? Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to try and address these recommendations. Um, I remain really worried about this. I think if you look at this from another angle, uh, this looks like, um, I'm not saying it is, but it looks like a report that's being brought to show that we've done our homework and ticked the box that we know in advance that if we overdevelop accidents to moving ahead, we are going to further pollute the river. Uh, and that what we're flagging is that maybe we can take some mitigation uh, measures which will keep the effect of, in essence, neutral. So we're not actually doing anything, not actually making any progress. So I'm worried about that, but we do have to address the recommendations. So um, I, I would like to suggest two further to the existing ones, Chair, if I may. Uh, and the first is a very short a recommendation. Three would be uh, that we refer this report to the overview committee for further consideration regarding the alarming environmental implications contained in this report. And then the second one is that the Strategic Planning Committee requires a further urgent report in six months time, updating us on the progress in these matters. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Arnott. Could you send a copy of those recommendations to Shirley, please. Do I have a seconder for those recommendations? Councillor Hookway. Councillor Hookway, do you want to come back? Yeah, I just, um, I just like to say before I second anything that, um, being as someone who is um, based in the western side of East Devon, I'm not familiar with the River Axe or its tributaries. Um, I've listened. 
to the state of affairs uh, and what's happening to this uh, uh, river, and I am appalled by what I hear. Absolutely appalled. Uh, how on earth can we call ourselves a district with an outstanding environment if we have a situation like this developing? It's quite clear that we, or to me anyway, it's quite clear that we must involve as many agencies as possible. And the thought that crossed my mind is that we uh, need, uh, I think, to uh, at some point in the near future, perhaps overview could do this, to write to our MPs to uh, tell them to raise uh, this case with the Secretary of State for the Environment, because this is something that I think would require uh, almost national uh, attention to, to deal with it. it is an extremely serious problem that will get much worse uh, in the long run. So yes, I'm happy to uh, second Councillor Arnott's uh, proposals. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hookway. You should uh, come over to the east of the districts, much better than the west. Um, Councillor David, do you have anything pressing or can we take this to the vote? Uh, well, I, I wanted to add that um, the, the working group has clearly not been established yet, has it? Um, but because the Nutrient Management Plan recommends the establishment of it, but there is the East Devon Catchment Partnership. And I, I wonder if Ed could just clarify whether that has met. Um, but uh, what I would like to recommend is the setting up of this working group as soon as possible, um, uh, with a report perhaps on, on its activities to come back to strategic planning and for that to be another recommendation. You, Councillor David. Ed, can you just clarify that? Yeah, so uh, in my understanding, we've basically been using the catchment partnership um, as, a, as a body to move this forward as the working party because it, it contains basically the bodies that would have made up the working party and is already working on trying to improve water quality within the acts anyway as part of its work. So it didn't seem to us to make sense to set up a, a new body when something is already in, in place. So we were utilising that existing body and obviously we can expand out its, its membership and engage other bodies as, as needed. So um, I, I think the existing arrangements are, are sufficient, at least for the moment, but we can obviously keep that under review as things progress. So Councillor David, are you just happy that that's obviously covered in the recommendations already listed? Um, yeah, well, I'm not sure it is covered in the recommendations, is it? I don't see any reference to uh, the, the East Devon uh, catchment uh, partnership there. So I wonder if we could receive a report on their meetings um, just to find out what they're doing, what, the, what they're able to do, who they're working with, um, and what kind of progress they've made. I think that needs to come back to this uh, committee. What I was saying was obviously with Councillor Arnott's uh, fourth uh, recommendation, what will now be the fourth recommendation, with a report coming back in six months' time, that will be mopped up in that. Okay, are we happy with that? Miss Shaw, can we just go to you just to confirm the recommendations and we'll take that to a vote. Thank you, Chair. Yes, you've got four elements to this motion. Firstly, that the Strategic Planning Committee note the work being undertaken at and for the River Axe and endorse the River Axe Nutrient Management Plan as evidence to inform council and partners' decisions. Secondly, note that the report should have specific relevance as a material consideration to inform local plan policy making and determination of planning applications. Thirdly, that this report is referred to the overview committee for further consideration regarding the alarming environmental impact implications in this report and fourthly that strategic planning committee requires a further urgent report in six months time updating it on the progress in these matters members please press your green tick if you're in support of this motion press your red cross if you are against the motion or please raise your hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote for the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. 
and chair i have 10 for none against and no oh 11 for i apologize none against and no abstention so that is carried chair thank you thanks very much and thanks very much members so agenda item number eight is the section 106 and community infrastructure levy audit report so we go to ed freeman for another report um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so apologies, first of all, if, if members have a sense of deja vu uh, about this report, because it has already been to Cabinet Audit and Governance and Scrutiny Committee, but obviously uh, it relates to delivery of the, the planning functions, um, and so important that this committee also um, have an opportunity to debate it. Um, so the Southwest Audit Partnership have undertaken an audit of the Section 106 and SIL system. Uh, the purpose of the audit was to ensure that appropriate arrangements are in place to manage the receipt and expenditure of 106 and SIL contributions. Um, the audit has uh, only given limited assurance, highlighting four key issues that have come out of that audit. Um, so just by way of summary, I'll just quickly summarise those four issues that they've highlighted in the actions that have come out of that work. Um, so issue one relates to a number of outstanding actions on our XCOM system, which members will recall is, is the, the um, IT software we use to, to monitor uh, SIL and Section 106 income and expenditure. Uh, the report highlighted uh, over a thousand outstanding actions on that system. Um, many of those, I should stress, are, are various checks and admin processes um, only 7% of those actions relate to payments needing to be invoiced or chased. Um, and the, the auditors are, are quick to stress that no money has actually been lost through that process. It's just been a delay in, in a small number of cases in terms of collecting and, and invoicing and chasing monies. Um, the remaining actions relate to things like um, checking our land charges records to ensure that they're up to date in terms of the discharge of um, requirements in agreements, that, that's actually the majority of those outstanding actions, um, and we're on, well on the way to processing those. Um, an action in relation to that was to re review resources um, and identify additional resources that were needed to help to get that those actions completed. Um, so that review has, has happened and we're currently out to um, recruitment for a part-time, oh, well, sorry, full-time but temporary um, post to help to support the um, Section 106 monitoring officer in completing those tasks. Um, the timescale for that is, is by to appoint someone by April this year and we should be well on track to doing that. Um, issue two related to a number of demands um, not being raised in a timely fashion and the recovery process being ineffective. Um, again, this, this relates to resources in terms of we've been focused on getting the XCOM system up to date in terms of getting all of the agreements and everything on the system. The next stage of that is then to create a new recovery process using that system. Um, so that's a key action coming out of that. Um, the resources, uh, staff resources obviously needed to help to make that happen. Um, but the time scale is to get that in place by June 2021. And as I say, uh, as soon as we get that, those additional staff resources in place, we should be on track to do that. Uh, issue three related to the participatory budgeting guides. Some members will be aware that the spend process goes through what's called participatory budgeting, where we engage with communities over the design. Uh, of the play areas and open spaces that we're, we're primarily delivering through the 106 monies. Um, that guide was considered to be out of date through this um, audit process. We have now updated that and the updated guidance has been online since the end of January. Um, although we will obviously keep that under review and try and improve that as, as time goes on as well. Uh, and finally, issue four was around town and parish councils not being advised of how much section 106 money has been collected and is available for spend in their town or parish. Um, this is envisaged to be resolved through the public facing module for the XCOM system. So the system that we've bought has a module that can be embedded on our website, which will effectively give the public a window into the system to be able to see how much money has been collected, how much is available to be spent in, in different areas of infrastructure. Um, so once we are content that the system is completely up to date, that can go live. We've actually had that operating successfully in the test system for some time. 
Uh, so once the, the data is complete, that can go live. Uh, that should happen by the end of March at the latest. Um, so that's just a quick run through the, the key findings and uh, what's happening to address those. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, within the next few months with those additional staff resources in place, uh, we will uh, be in a much better position in relation to those, those four issues um, and to be in a good place moving forward with this area of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I know this, this item is pretty much been, it's gone round the houses and been done to death in different, various committees. So I'm happy to propose from the chair the, uh, we just note the report. If no one else has anything else they wish to say, Councillor Howe. Thank you, Chair. Um, purely, I suppose, because of my history with SIL and Section 106, um, I'm just going to query with Mr. Freeman because obviously, uh, who knew a year ago we were going to be in this situation for the last 12 months? I get that. I understand why it's happened and everything else, but nevertheless, a lot of work's been gone into this, uh, particularly by our Section 106 officer, who quite understandably keeps getting pulled off for other more important things like COVID has been for all our staff in, in, in Blackdown House and other locations. But I'm nervous, nervous and positive at the same time about spending more money if we don't finally get it over the line. We spent money in the past getting temps in to get it done so far. It was never finished. And then, of course, we get diverted. We have to make a firm commitment this time to say this money, which we have to spend in a strange way, we have to then protect our Section 106 officer to make sure this job is finished within the timeline and doesn't get waylaid, diverted, so we keep going back around this circle. So I'm just looking for assurance that Mr. Freeman will take it to the Strategic Management Partnership, that this is the final time anyone on this committee or any other committee wants to see this come back. We want it finished, we want it done, you know, and this is it, shall we say. I hope that's a positive message, but with a bit of a, you know what I mean, Mr. Freeman. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. Councillor Arnott. Sorry, Chair, yeah, I, I understand you want to move on quickly from this. Uh, a question which is, uh, does anybody know when this is coming to scrutiny? Because I think that's probably the key form for it next. I'll just leave that hanging while somebody tries to find out. And also just to um, refer to Councillor Howe's point, I think the essence of this report really wasn't about the period affected by the pandemic. I think Councillor Howe is absolutely right. Over and over again, to my certain knowledge, for at least a decade, there was always a reason why the S106 function was denuded of people there. Um, this is why I asked for this report to be brought forward by at least six months, which is why we've got it now. We had to address this. Um, and there are more than just planning and financial considerations here. There are democratic considerations, isn't necessarily part of our role, but what was happening, and it was absolutely happening out there, was that town and parish councils were losing faith in how their district was operating the S506 system for them. And I've always slightly worried about, I mean, I think it's great that XCOM is coming forward, although I always think of Skynet from the Terminator movies. I'm kind of thinking, wasn't there a simpler way to do this, you know, actually? But anyway, we are where we are, and, and, and I look forward to it having a forward-facing, customer-facing, front-facing, upward-facing, whatever it is. Let's just have a list per town of how much money there is. And I, I know that now exists, so that's very welcome. But it didn't for years, and people were confused. So I hope that's brought somebody enough time to advise me. Do they know when this comes to scrutiny? Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Arnott. Ed Freeman, and then we'll go to the vote. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's, it's actually already been to scrutiny committee. It went on the 4th of February and uh, was discussed there. So um, I, I wasn't envisaging it, it going back to scrutiny um, in the future. Um, I think this is its last, uh, last port of call, um, as far as I was aware, um, but happy to be corrected on that. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Howe's comments, uh, believe me, no, no one wants this resolved probably more than me. Um, uh, it's been going on far too long um, and um, 
it, it, yeah, it's been a product of partly resourcing. We did have resources in place to help to support this. Unfortunately, those two temps didn't see the project through to its completion. Um, and we've perhaps been struggling to resource it since then for a variety of reasons that I won't bother going into now. But um, I think we are now on a, a course to getting this resolved once and for all in the next few months. Um, and, and hopefully that is yes the last you will need to hear of it and, and hopefully we will have a, a smooth system moving forward I do genuinely believe it will be worth it in that the XCOM system provides uh, a way of managing this area of work and providing uh, an open and transparent system like we never managed to have before uh, with the previous system uh, of, of spreadsheets. So I think hopefully we can win back people's confidence when this is all in place quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed Freeman. Sure, if there's no other questions, Councillor Arnold. Sorry, you, Chair. I've just 10 more seconds. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've just checked what happened at scrutiny. And actually what is happening is that... Uh, it's now about scoping, isn't it? I think that's what's going on there. And I'm, I'm guessing that there's a further report to come back to scrutiny, but I, 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 think, I think that's the case. I, but that's a very quick reading of the minutes. So in other words, it wasn't the definitive word at scrutiny. I think it's scoping how scrutiny is gonna look into it. Anyway, thanks. Jeff. I see Anita Williams is, shaking, uh, is nodding ahead at that, so. That's correct. Perfect. I think, yeah, I think, Chair, I think that's the case. Thanks very much. Miss Shaw, can we go to just reading out the recommendations and go to a vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, there's one element to this recommendation that members consider the findings and recommendations of the attached internal audit report on the management of the receipt and expenditure of Section 106 and community infrastructure levy contributions. Members, please press your green tick if you're in support of the motion, press your red cross if you're against the motion, or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. The benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And Chair, that is 11 votes for, uh, zero votes against, zero abstentions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Debbie. Uh, move on to agenda item number nine, which is the habitat mitigation non-infrastructure contributions. And again, it's over to you, Ed Freeman, for a report. Um, thank you, Chairman. So um, members will hopefully be aware that um, we collect uh, monies towards a habitat, habitat mitigation strategy towards um, the recreational impacts of development on the Exestria and East Devon Pebble Bed Heaths in partnership with our neighbouring authorities at Teambridge District Council next to City Council. Uh, and that's done through a, a mixture of um, taking money out of our SIL pot um, towards infrastructure projects within that mitigation strategy. Um, and then there's also a non-infrastructure element to that mitigation strategy, which is funded through uh, what we call Section 111 agreements under the Local Government Act or under Section 106 agreement, where there is one proposed to be in place for that development for other purposes. Um, and those contributions are, are calculated on a, a per dwelling basis. So at the moment, those charges are um, table in Table 1 in the report, Paragraph 1.6, and you'll see they're £164 for the X only, £190 per dwelling for the Pebble Bed Heaths only, or £354 per dwelling where it lies within the 10 kilometre zone for both of those areas. Um, so this report um, looks to amend those um, contribution amounts uh, following on from a meeting of the Habitat Mitigations Board where staffing, uh, staff resources for the delivery of the strategy were looked at um, and it was determined that the staff that were appointed uh, at the start of this work on a five-year delivery programme uh, should um, be made on a fixed term basis in respect of the delivery manager and the Habitat Mitigations Officers. Uh, with those posts becoming permanent um, and that the Devon Loves Dogs coordinator post be extended for a further five years. That leads to additional financial costs on the strategy which um, need to be covered through this non-infrastructure route as obviously staff resources is a non-infrastructure -inf element of the strategy. 
Um, in addition to that, the um, delivery of the strategy has taken up some uh, resource from the communications officer um, who sits within the growth and prosperity team. Um, and that hasn't previously been accounted for through uh, the costings for the mitigation strategy. That's just been absorbed through the budget for the growth and prosperity team. Um, and so it's now proposed to more formalize that arrangement by recovering those costs through this uh, strategy approach um, so that those aren't uh, borne by East Devon Council alone. Um, the net result of this is a need to increase contributions by £6.81 per house per site, which leads to a need to revise the charges to those detailed in Table 2 in the report at paragraph 2.4. So that means the X becomes £170.81, the pebble bed heaps £196.81, and uh, per dwelling charge for both areas, £367.62. Uh, the proposed is to collect those through the existing means. Um, so it's really just changing those charges um, to recover those additional costs, basically, of delivering the strategy. Um, so the recommendation is that we do that. I would like to make one minor change to the recommendation in that at present it says that this should apply to applications received after the 1st of March 2021. Um, however, mindful that we do need to give applicants um, a reasonable uh, notice of, of this change, given that they need to get the agreement signed often by landowners and, and banks in advance of submission of the applications. Um, and also um, that it does seem to make sense to align this with the change in the financial year. So I would be recommending now that that actually is introduced from the 1st of April 2021 uh, to give us a bit more time to, to notify applicants and agents of this change and publicise it, which we haven't been able to do before now. Um, and also to tie this in with the change in the financial year, which um, We'll, we'll address a number of accounting complications. Um, so uh, I would make that recommendation to members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Freeman. Does any non-member wish to speak on this item? No, so we'll move to Councillor Eleanor Rylance. Thank you, Chair. I, I did just have one question actually for Ed. Um, so in uh, paragraph 2.1, you say to achieve this, it is proposed to redirect some monies that were allocated to monitoring of the strategy and the delivery of a project that now appears to be unachievable. I, I may have just misunderstood something, but is that is that a pro uh, which project is that that's deemed to be unachievable and who's deemed it to be unachievable? Thanks very much, Councillor Rylance. We'll move to Councillor Howe and then go back to Ed Freeman. Councillor Howe. Thank you. I was going to move the recommendation because uh, I'm quite happy with it, with Ed's uh, amendment. So um, obviously, if you can answer Eleanor's question, then fine, shall we say. But I'm happy to move. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. Can I have a seconder for that? Councillor Hookway, seconding. Ed, do you want to just come back on Councillor Rylance's comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head the details of, of the particular project. Um, I, I think it came through, obviously, regular monitoring and review of, of the delivery of the strategy, which goes through the Habitat Mitigations Executive Committee. Uh, so it would have been them that have determined that that should no longer form part of, of the strategy. Um, but I can't for the life of me remember what the exact project was, um, but happy to check the minutes of that committee and, and uh, ping you an email to let you know. Is that okay, Councillor Rylance? Perfect, thank you. Councillor Howe, just on the recommendation, uh, just for clarity and also for, for members uh, watching, that you're proposing the new recommendation of the 1st of April, not what is listed on the agenda report. I, I am proposing exactly what Ed asked us to change, shall I Perfect. say. Perfect, thank right. you. Mrs Shaw, over to you and then we'll take a vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, one element to this one, that members agree that the revised non-infrastructure habitats mitigation contributions as shown in Table 1 within the report 
be required for all applications for residential developments within the habitat mitigation zone that are received after the 1st of April 2021. Again, please press your green tick if you're in support of the motion, press your red cross if you're against the motion, and raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. Sorry, table one or table two, Mrs Shaw? I beg your pardon, table two. Did I say table one? I do apologise. <laughs> table two within the report. Okay, so Chair, you have 11 votes for the proposal, uh, zero votes against and zero abstentions. Thank you, Chair. That's carried. Thanks very much. Uh, move on to agenda item 10, which is the East Devon Plain Pitch Strategy. And again, over to you, Ed Freeman, for your report. Um, thank you, Chairman. So um, members may recall that the committee resolved to um, authorise production of a new playing pitch strategy for East Devon at their meeting of the 26th of March 2019. Um, and this report really is just to update members on progress with that work, which has been uh, unfortunately delayed due to the uh, current circumstances with the, the pandemic. Um, a, a quite a lot of early work was undertaken throughout 2019 in terms of engaging with Sport England and the governing bodies on a desktop basis in terms of understanding uh, the evidence, um, assimilating data on clubs and the various teams that exist within the district, um, existing use of pitches within the district, how well they're used and, and, and mapping that data. Um, the next stage was a ver verification process, uh, which involved um, much more intense communication with governing bodies and clubs, uh, which we would ha was hoping to undertake um, during last year. However, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, it's been difficult to engage with those bodies whose attention has been uh, focused elsewhere during that period. Um, Obviously, this is important work in terms of uh, making recommendations about protecting the use of existing pitches, making better use and enhancement of facilities and opportunities to provide new pitches. Um, and, and it's also an important evidence document for production of the new local plan. Indeed, I note Sport England have responded to the current issues and options consultation, advising us that if we don't have an up-to-date playing pitch strategy uh, to accompany the new local plan when it's submitted for examination, they will be objecting. Um, so there is a clear need to uh, progress this work. Um, and obviously, hopefully, as things start to unlock over the coming months, uh, the governing bodies and the clubs will have more time to help us with this work and, and help us to progress it. Um, but it has unfortunately been delayed um, and, and paused over the last uh, much of the last year. So there are three options identified in the report for taking this work forward now. Uh, the first is relying on um, the internal staff and resources to move this forward, conscious that we don't want to delay production of the local plan but clearly this is an element of that work. Um, the second is, is to defer this work although I would suggest given Sports England's comments that's potentially not uh, really a viable option uh, and the third is to send it out to external consultants to complete this work albeit we do have some reservations about that, that approach um, and how willing they will be you how willing they will be to use the work that we've already undertaken on this project, which is not um, inconsiderable. Um, the potential cost implications of that and, and whether they will actually be able to progress it a great deal quicker than we can in the house. Um, so I, I suppose I, I perhaps marginally favor progressing it in house, um, but conscious that um, that could be delayed because clearly the priority has to be progression of the local plan. Um, and obviously, uh, we are still trying to recruit the additional posts that um, were added to bolster the local plan team for that work. So timescales on that are slightly uncertain as well. We think overall that um, taking all of that into account, we should be able to progress this work and complete it within 12 to 18 months. Um, but obviously, there is a danger within that timescale that funding schemes may come forward. Uh, as part of the recovery for um, sports clubs in the district that um, will not be able to be supported by an updated playing pitch strategy. Um, would, however, say that we do the old playing pitch strategy, obviously, uh, can still be used to some extent as a basis for, for that work, although I would expect Sport England and, and other governing bodies to have some concerns about 
it, it's being what is it now five six years old um so it, it is some form of evidence base but not ideal in in that respect um so a couple of a number of issues there the main one really seeking members advice on how they wish to proceed with this work given the current circumstances thank you thanks very much ed um this is a topic that i asked to to, to come forward after a, a meeting with uh representatives of the Football Foundation, uh, where they informed me that there is up to three million pounds available match funding um, for East Devon community sports uh, clubs currently, and that will reopen uh, from April next month. So it's something um, to think about, and that's why I asked for the report to come to, to members. Um, is there anyone from outside of Cabinet who wishes to speak on this? Councillor Jack Rowland. Thank you, Chair. Um, being somewhat of a sports fanatic, it's a subject very close to my heart on this one. And having attended the um, LED monitoring forum this morning, and in view of the work that's going on between Sport England and Strategic Leisure, um, I'm just wondering if there's any possibility that where Strategic Leisure are carrying out a um, an audit, in fact, of all the leisure facilities within the district as part of that work. I wonder if there's any mileage in actually saying that um, this could actually help on this particular subject as well. Thanks very much, Jack. Well, are there anyone from else outside of cabinet that wish uh, outside of cabinet outside of committee who wish to speak? No. So Ed. Oh, Councillor Hall. Uh, really, um, Chair, just really declare my interest, uh, personal interest as being Chairman of Club Lawn Sports Centre. And going forward, we like to hope that we'll be able to include netball as a sport in the Axe Valley uh, very shortly because we've got a massive catchment area which actually rose in South Somerset and West Dorset. And there's a big need for it, under-representation on uh, young ladies' sport in the Axe Valley and East Devon come to that. So, we look forward to any initiatives that East Devon could support a local charity. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks very much, Councillor Hall. Ed, do you think you just cover off uh, Councillor Rowland's question and then we'll, we'll move into committee? Uh, yes, certainly, Chairman. Um, yes, I mean, of course, we're keen to, to join up the work with work that LED are doing. Um, I mean, obviously, the use of LED's facilities is, is part of this in terms of the playing pitches that they uh, manage on, on the Council's behalf. Um, clearly, this work goes way beyond that in terms of every playing pitch in the district, whether LED or, or privately owned or, or otherwise. Um, but certainly, um, I'm sure we liaised with LED on, on the previous study and would continue to do so and work with them on this piece of work as well. Chair, can I just come back on that, if you permit me? Um, it was just to point out as well that um, what emerged this morning from Strategic Leisure is when they're going to do the um, diagnostic report, they are looking at all the facilities across, across the district, not just those covered by LED. So that's why I was thinking that this could actually help on this subject. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we'll move into committee now. Um, Councillor Eleanor Rylands. Sorry, I always need to be first. Um, so uh, I have a, a, a series of questions, actually. So one of my questions is, does your inventory of playing pitches include um, clubs that are currently pay, playing on village playing fields or village recreation grounds? That's my first question. My second question is, um, would it be expedient to, um, to request from villagers uh, the insights from their neighbourhood plans about emerging sports pitches in order to get some synergies going between neighbourhood plans and the local plan and maybe produce things faster and, and with um, sort of more synergistic budgets? And my third question was about diversity and site specific specificity of, of, of sports. So, for example, Exmouth would be ripe for having beach volleyball, for example. Um, it would be great if we could see some, you know, some properly elite sports being introduced into East Devon that actually aren't already here. And I'm getting from the report a sort of quite a lack of hockey pitches, for example, and Councillor Hall's um, lack of netball pitches over in Axminster. Maybe we could try, you know, looking at this as a, on a whole district basis to try to limit the amount of time people have to spend in the car in order to get to a, a particularly specific site. 
Um, I, the other thing I'm, I'm, I'm perceiving from the report is that you can't actually mix and match certain sports. So it's not really ideal to have football or, or rugby happening on the same pitch as hockey, for example. Um, that's the sort of impression I'm getting. So, yeah, I mean, for, most, for me, the most valuable question is about the synergies between neighbourhood plans, where the work's already been done, and what we're trying to achieve through the, the local plan. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Rylance. We'll go to Councillor Hookway next. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, Dan, thank Ed for his report. Yeah, this is a huge topic, absolutely uh, critical. A lot of people very, very um, interested in it. Uh, I seem to have picked up quite a bit of this in my new portfolio of cultural as a sport and tourism. Um, Council Rylance's comments about beach volleyball at Exmouth are interesting. Um, we've got a bit of a problem with the beach there at the moment, so that's going to uh, require some uh, interdisciplinary planning. Um, but the recent um, meeting, delegated meeting about Warren View, indicated there's some very uh, important developments that need to come forward with pitches. Um, my main point for really um, asking the speaker is to do with the options really I think it's a quite we've got quite a challenge here I certainly don't want to use consultants I don't think that's a good idea judging by the caution that's expressed in the report um, you know we we have now have a roadmap out of Covid um, but the local plan is really really important so um, I would suggest that the local plan has the priority, as we all seem to think it's the most important thing, and that we um, uh, crack on with the playing pitch strategy as soon as uh, uh, we are out of COVID. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Hookway. Councillor Howe, over to you next. Thank you. Um, I'll follow on from what's just been said, is I support would support uh, Mr Freeman in keeping it in-house. Um, I think by far that is the best way of doing it. It gives us the control over it. It allows us to ask the questions instead of a third party coming in, starting afresh, because they won't rely on our data to start with anyway, um, doing the work, taking a profit and all the rest of it. Um, we are the people, the eyesight, and our offices are the eyes on the ground in the district permanently. Um, and we should be able to get the expertise done again as we had in the past. So I would fully support Mr. Freeman in his hope to keep it in-house and do it as fast as possible. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Howe. So Councillor Hookway, was that a proposal from you? And then Councillor Howe, was that you seconding Councillor Hookway's proposal? Yes, yes, I, I, I will happily propose uh, that we uh, select option B, um, I'd keep it in-house and then but also proceed with the local plan as necessary. Thank you very much, Councillor Howe. Yeah, more than happy. Thank you very much. Ed, we'll just go to you and then we'll take the last two speakers and hopefully take it to a, to a vote. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, so yeah, just to come back really on, on the points raised, I mean, I, I think clearly we'll use all sources of information we can to try and identify the aspirations and needs of our communities. So neighbourhood planning, yes, contacting all the various clubs that exist, governing bodies, um, any source of information is, is welcome to us. Obviously, working with LED, um, interesting that they're looking at a, a wider audit. I wasn't aware of that. So we'll obviously get in touch with them and see how, what the synergies are there and how we can link that up. That obviously may, may well help to progress this, this project more quickly uh, as well. So, um, and obviously keen to, to engage with new and different sports as well, netball, um, beach volleyball. Um, anything that requires a, a, a pitch would be within scope to to, to try and um, move that forward. So, yes, happy to to do all of those things. Um, I would just point out in terms of the recommendation that though um, retaining the work in-house is option A in paragraph 5.4 report. I think there was a reference to option B. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Um, Councillor Ingham next. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to ask um, what strategic communications, long-term strategic communications, our officers have had with, say, for example, Julian Tagg of Exeter City and with Tony Rowe of Exeter Chiefs and indeed with Somerset uh, County Cricket Club to understand how we can get a better relationship in supporting them and them supporting us. Uh, how far have you got with those sort of discussions? 
Thank you very much, Councillor Ingham. We'll go to Councillor Arnott and then get your questions answered then. Councillor Arnott. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd just like to draw on uh, uh, Councillor Rowland's point uh, from earlier, which I think is very important. Um, and it may, it may need, we do need a rather recommendation. So uh, I, th I think the majority of members here today, I think, weren't at the LED monitoring forum this morning. And that was very important. It was a very significant presentation by Strategic Leisure who draw on the methods established by Sport England. And what they are now going to do as commissioned by us as a council is a complete analysis and assessment of sports provision, whether it be uh, from LED or whether it be elsewhere um, in towns that don't have an LED presence. And that is a piece of work that's currently happening. Um, it just, it, um, I can't see how it's productive if the two pieces of work aren't linked. Um, <clears throat> and therefore there becomes an internal contradiction, doesn't there? If we're saying we're doing this ourselves, but I'm about to put a third recommendation forward that suggests actually uh, we work with them. Well, look, Chair, can I can I let me float a third recommendation and see if that if that if that works? <clears throat> it's one line um, that officers liaise with strategic leisures, current analysis of sports facilities across the district. That would be recommendation three. So what that does is that formalizes the the overlap between the two. I don't know if we can do that here, or whether that needs to go you know upstairs to <clears throat> cabinet or council I'm not quite sure but it does it, it, it does seem odd to have the two lots of people doing similar work when we've just had this initiative to try and bring in some you know quite heavy help from um, LED and other other areas thank you <coughs> I'll, I'll go to Ed Freeman just to answer the questions and gain his advice on that recommendation before I go back to the the proposer and seconder so Ed Freeman whenever you're ready um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I mean, on the point Councillor Arnott just makes, I, I wasn't party to those discussions with LED either, so I would need to have conversations with them to understand the synergy between the two projects and how we can, can merge those together, but keen to work with them and, and, and other bodies to, to try and move this work forward. And um, it sounds from what's been said like there's quite, quite a close relationship between the two pieces of work, so we need to maximise that and make sure we're not... Uh, doubling up and uh, repeating ourselves and, and wasting resources that could be better directed. So uh, we'll certainly have those those conversations in in house and uh, we'll work out what, if any, further authorizations are, are needed through members, through other committees and, and, and groups and, and take that forward. So um, perhaps if, if members are happy to leave that with me as an action, I can, can progress that. Um, in, in terms of Councillor Ingham's point, um, certainly part of the next phase of the project is engaging with all of the governing bodies and the various clubs. So that would involve engaging with Exeter Chiefs, Exeter City, for example, who, while not based in our, our district, obviously have a keen interest with their training grounds in our 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 district and their facilities um, and, and also they uh, undertake events and things throughout throughout the district as I understand it as well so clearly we will want to engage with those and, and other bodies and, and, and teams through through the next phase of this work. Thank you. Thank you very much Ed. Um, Councillor Hookway and Councillor Howe are you happy to take the amendment proposed by Councillor Arnold? Yes I'm happy thank you Chair. Councillor Howe? Doesn't seem to make any difference to me so quite happy. Thank you very much. Councillor Thomas, I, I saw that your hand went up and then went back down. Do you have anything you wish to say? Uh, sorry, Chair, it was just a co confusion that Mr Freeman noted in regards to um, option B being described in the same way as option A earlier on, but that was clarified. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So, Councillor Moulding, over to you. Yes, yeah, so I was at the LED monitoring forum this morning, Chair. And um, and I, I take the point that Councillor Arnott has made, but uh, the lady from um, Strategic Leisure was was often making the point that the um, study that they would be doing would be at a very high level, a high level overview of the sporting con context of East Devon. 
but I don't think it would uh, delve down into individual clubs with individual pitches and youth pitches, etc. So I think I think there ought to be some link between the two studies, the playing pitch strategy and the strategy being done uh, uh, through strategic leisure. But I don't think necessarily we need wait for one to be complete before the other one gets underway. Thank you very much, Councillor Moulding. So with no other speakers, I think we'll take that to a vote. Mrs Shaw, if you could just confirm what members are voting on and we'll take it from there. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, in light of um, Ed Freeman's comment in relation to which option, now I am taking it that it is the option A, that officers of the planning policy section complete the playing pitch strategy, which Councillor Hookway and Councillor Howe have moved for going forward for the vote. Am I correct in that? I believe so, yes. Thank you, okay. Therefore, we have three elements to this, members. That one, that members note the progress to date of the new planning playing pitch strategy for East Devon. Secondly, that members have considered the options for progressing the new playing pitch strategy and officers of the play planning policy section complete the playing pitch strategy. And thirdly, the officers liaise with the strategic leisure's current analysis of sports facilities across the district. Members, please when, press your green tick if you are in support of the motion, press your red cross if you're against the motion and raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining from the vote. So for the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And Chair, I have 11 votes for, uh, zero votes against and zero abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, agenda item 11 is a summary of the self-build monitoring report. Um, and Ed Freeman, over to you to present your report. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, so this is another annual monitoring report. Um, so uh, hopefully members will recall having seen these in the past. Um, and it looks to record on the um, self-build register in terms of uh, people that have registered in the last year. So you see that 23 people have registered uh, their interest in, in self-build uh, on the self-build register over the last uh, year. So this is the calendar year from the end of October 2019 to the end of October 2020, just to be clear. Um, and uh, there's this uh, strange calculation we have to go through that then tells us how many service plots we're required to meet under the legislation um, based on the, uh, the time periods by which we have to deliver the plots from when they were were registered on the system, which gives us a number of, of 13 plots that need to be suitable for self-build within that period. Um, and we've delivered far in excess of that um, in terms of permissions that have been granted. Um, and uh, that's really it in terms of the, the, the monitoring. Um, uh, I think it's important to note, obviously, the ongoing interest in, in self-build in the district um, as a, as a means of looking ahead really towards uh, the next local plan and measures we might want to take both through the local plan and, and more widely. So added in a section on, in paragraph 3.2 that, that looks at some of those measures which members may want to consider for promoting and uh, delivering um, self-build plots in, in the district. Um, I think we've also asked questions in the issues and options uh, consultation that's out at the moment in terms of the new local plan, in terms of uh, different delivery models for delivering housing in the district and different providers of which self and custom build plots would be part of that. So it'd be interesting to see what kind of response we receive from that as well. But there does seem to be growing interest in the district in self and custom build housing plots. Um, and so perhaps something for discussion either now or at a later date in terms of how we can uh, bring that forward through the next local plan and other measures that we could uh, bring forward to do that. But in the meantime, the monitoring position is is very much of uh, continued interest and delivery of, of plots to, to meet that demand, at least on, on the sort of superficial level of what we're required to do under the legislation. Uh, but there are obviously options for more proactive approach as detailed in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um... I think we can all agree we'd like to see more uh, self-builds in the district. Um, 
Does anyone from outside of committee wish to speak? No, does anyone from inside of the committee wish to speak on this item? Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, well, Ed has suggested that we uh, look again at the um, suggested options in uh, 3.2 and I noticed that originally uh, the committee only went for the last option, but there are quite a few. Um, and I would have thought that establishing a self-build forum um, could be a, a fairly easy thing to do. In some ways, I'd rather it came from the community itself rather than us try to do it. But if we can nudge it in the right direction, I wonder if it, even just something like a Facebook page where people could uh, exchange ideas um, and uh, experiences would, um, would be a, a good thing to do. Um, and also, I noticed that one of the provisions was reducing or deleting the, the pre-application advice charges, um, which it seems a very sensible thing to do for those individuals uh, wishing to uh, go into self-build. Um, so I wonder if we could uh, look again at uh, some of those options. I'd be interested to see what other members think. Thank you very much, Councillor Davey. Just for members, that was 3.2 in the report, all of the options are listed. Um, Councillor Eleanor Rylance. Thank you, Chair. So um, it doesn't seem to me like this enormously large number of people coming forward. And I'm wondering if people are aware enough of the existence of this, of this register, because it's been running for several years now, and it doesn't seem like very many people are actually even on it. I'm just wondering, given that affordable houses are, are well, sorry, Self-built houses are affordable by design because people only build ultimately what they can afford unless they undertake a grand design monstrosity. And, you know, coupled with the fact that it's going to be apl applicable to East Dev people with an East Devon connection, I'm just wondering whether we can actually make more effort to actually encourage people to be aware of the scheme. Um, and, uh, you know, given the, the, gr the, growing, um, the growing popularity of self-build, it, it just seems surprising that there are more people coming forwards and people aren't more aware of it. So I'm just wondering, are we advertising it in the right way? Could we take up Ollie's idea maybe of starting a, an online forum for people who are interested in self-build, you know, just give them more information in a, in a relatively informal way? Um, yeah, so I do support what Ollie just said, actually. Thank you very much. Councillor Kevin Blakey next. Thank you, Chair. And again, coming back to uh, point 3.2 um, with regard to the options. Um, yes, the, the first bullet point, which is to refresh the, um, uh, the register, good idea. But uh, I particularly support the idea of a specific Cranbrook register. <clears throat> um, some self-building Cranbrook would be, I think, a very good idea because it would have the benefit of uh, adding some uh, some variety to um, some of the frankly rather bland um, landscapes that we, we currently have, particularly in the newer phases where there's a lot of uniformity in the housing. And I, th I think that uh, the more we can do to encourage self-build, um, so much the better. Um, I would like to see it as a planning requirement actually for some of the, um, uh, the, the, the larger scale development um, plans coming forward. Um, so that uh, this becomes less of um, a matter of an option, but something which is a requirement placed on the developers to set aside some land, some plots for self-build. Um, and as I say, that way we will end up with um, some of the uniformity broken up and also want to support the idea of um, doing away with the fees for individual self-builds, um, single plots. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just for uh, a bit of information, Kevin, and uh, Ed can correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Cranbrook plan, currently there is a requirement for 4% custom and self-builds. Is that correct, Ed? Um, yeah. So there will be an expansion areas, 4% uh, will have to be custom or self-builds. And what we I would hope that we'd be pushing for is that there would most likely be self-builds rather than custom. That is my personal opinion. I, I'd rather see more self-builds so that they've got more identity. Um, Councillor Arnott, you're up next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, also following on from Councillor Blakey, looking again at 3.2, uh, 
Um, I think the paper in October 2019 was a great credit to Councillor Bond and the Strategic Planning Committee and officers at the time. Uh, it, it, it stands the test of time, obviously, specifically in relation to Cranbrook, as Councillor Blakey said, but I think all of the other points there as well. I'm really glad you've brought this forward onto the agenda today. It just feels like it needs a bit of a fillip, doesn't it? Um, it feels as if maybe, you know, these things happen, don't they? And the pandemic's no excuse, but maybe it's lost its way a bit. Um, so uh, I I would just say, again, I'm, I'm not pointing that way to South, I'm pointing that way to the to urban Collerton over there. We have whole streets of Collerton that were built in the uh, 60s, 70s and 80s, entirely self-built by local people, and many of them still live there. They're, they're a good age now, most of them, um, and they're extremely well made, and genuine local people really appreciate the opportunities to do these things across the district. So, um, yeah, I'm very much in favour of this, Chair. I think this is it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a, an initiative we need to try and get behind, you know, there were some great ideas, weren't there, back in 2019, member champions for self-build and all, all the rest of it. I don't not sure if we can get to that quite yet, but certainly the planning suggestions and the corporate options mainly are, are you know, as, as alive today as they were then. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. So we'll go to Ed Freeman just to answer everyone's questions. Whilst he's answering the questions, can committee members start working up some proposals to bring back. So Ed, over to you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure there were specific questions, but I mean, I think there are a number of options there. I, I think um, Councillor Davy perhaps picked up on what I would consider to be one of the key ones, which is establishing a self-build forum, because I think that would give us an opportunity to discuss these issues with those interested in self-build in the district and indeed some that already have experience of self-build either in the district or, or elsewhere to then engage them in understanding which of the other measures might be most effective because at the moment we're slightly second guessing what would be effective for example reducing or deleting pre-application advice charges w would that make a difference to people I honestly don't know um, how well received a newsletter or, or supplementary planning guidance would be received uh, and what it would achieve. Uh, I think a lot of those planning options measures probably start with some kind of forum as a sounding board for some of the other options in there and, and to engage um, people that, who, who are our target audience, shall we say, for some of those things um, in, in informing what, what we do moving forward. Um, so I, I would be quite keen to pursue that if members are, are so minded. Um, and so I think some of the other options could then be informed by feedback from, from that group. Um, I hope that's helpful. Definitely helpful. Thanks very much, Ed. Councillor Howe, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's really coming back to an old thing. You, you try to learn from the ones that are doing the best, I think. Now, we know Teambridge has succeeded quite well in this area in the past, and I assume we're still talking to Teambridge and um, learning from their experiences. Certainly they were doing well 18 months ago when we last spoke to them formally. Um, but other councils up and down the country have done even better than Teambridge by providing a field with 12 or 18 ser fully serviced plots, utilities installed and outline permission for houses. That makes it very easy for genuine self-builders to come in and start to self-build themselves. Now, we have various master plans. We have the Cranbrook master plan that will allow some self-build to a certain extent, um, but we don't know the shape and form of that self-build yet and how it's going to be laid out. I imagine it will be a field that will be allocated, um, but no services provided because obviously there'll be options on it and the expense might be reasonably high. I'd like to see us taking more proactive um, action with our next local plan as to what we expect these developers who are going to have to put these self-building sites in uh, will do provide because they should lay them out to a certain extent. They should put the services in because let's face it, if it's part of a major development, they're putting the services in everywhere else. So they should lay the services as well. And we should know the cost is going to be to the um, future owner, what they're going to end up paying for that plot, etc. 
So we need to make it simple. We need to make it good. And we need to make it easy for these people to get on the housing ladder, particularly in the current climate we're in. So, you know, I haven't got a recommendation at present for you guys. I don't know what the recommendation is, but I do think we need to learn from the best as part of our local plan and aim to achieve highly to make this as easy and as simple for people going in to achieve their dreams of home ownership and a place to live forever. Not forever, that's almost impossible, but you get my meaning. <laughs> for their, their lives and their families' lives, which is what we want and need in this community. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Howe. Um, I don't have any other speakers. Does anyone have a recommendation they want to bring forward at this time? Councillor Davey. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I will. Uh, I've just been looking on our uh, planning website and there's actually nothing that I can see on there about self-build. Um, so it wouldn't be very difficult to, to just add a little category there. Um, just something that says interested in self-build. Um, you could put in a link to the self-build portal, which um, has some uh, useful information, although I don't, uh, for some reason on my iPad, anyway, the uh, frequently asked questions don't work. I've just been trying that. Um, but that's their problem. Um, but uh, I wonder if we could uh, to make it a, a recommendation that we uh, put some advice for self-builders um, on our website. Um, and perhaps set up, um, I don't know where would be the best place to do it or how would be the best place to do it, but we uh, go about setting up a forum uh, where people can get information and advice and learn from others' experiences. So just on, just on that point, we do have um, information on the website on the self-build register. Is it perhaps uh, better to speak with our comms team on how we can highlight that issue? And after the, obviously the the finish of this consultation period, we look to to promote the self build register um, and the contents on the website as much as possible, and that would be one part of the recommendation. And then the second part would be setting up the forum. Would you be okay with that, Councillor Davy? Uh, yes, I, I think so. Um, yeah, you're right. There is something about uh, self-build and custom building planning, but I couldn't see it um, initially. So when, when you go to the home page for planning, there's nothing there. So I wonder if perhaps the link could be bumped up a bit um, so that it's a bit more obvious. Um, but if you search for uh, self-build, yes, there's quite a lot of information there then. Um, but I, I think we need more than just a register. We, we need to be proactively promoting self-build um as uh, councillor howe was saying it, it, we need to be doing a bit more to ensure that more people come forward and as councillor ryland said 23 people doesn't seem an awful lot um given that it's it's an option that quite a few people could pursue i, I, don't, I don't quite know how to uh, put that into a recommendation perhaps just that, that we uh, promote it a little more through our planning website if I could perhaps help with some wording, Councillor Davey. Um, al along with the other recommendations that are within the report, which you may consider to, to move as well, um, and, and other option, speak to the communications team to um, promote as to opportunities to promote self-build within the district. Uh, opportunities and then the creation of a self-build forum or an establishing a self-build forum taking the words from paragraph 3.2 is that the sort of thing you were you were wanting to put forward yeah that's very helpful mrs Shaw. thank you great so that's ollie uh councillor davy proposing that councillor how are you seconding or have you got your hand up for another reason? You're muted. Sorry, uh, mix of both. I'm happy to support, but I would actually like to add another um, element to this. Um, I believe we need to, um, I'm trying to think of the words in my head at this minute in time, so it could be complicated, go further than we currently are. So I, I would ask um, 
Mr. Freeman's team to research other avenues that we can make the acquisition of self-build simpler for our local plan. So we need to take put it into our new local plan, you know, different ways of operating to make these sites simpler to acquire and go from. Um, and I want to use best practice. So I, I'm trying to think of wording that, um, Shirley, help me if you can, or Mr. Freeman, even you know what I'm trying to achieve. Um, <laughs> Uh, we just need that change of emphasis, a recommendation to Mr. Freeman and his team to go further for our local plan to find out how we do fully deliver to deliver fully serviced and permissioned plots to end needers. If that makes some sense. Okay. Whilst Shirley's working up a, a, a wording for that, we'll just go to Councillor Eileen Rag. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered whether any more thought had been given to a, a suggestion I made to you some time ago now uh, about whether it would be possible for the council um, to give mortgages. Um, it might come as a surprise, but they used to give mortgages. Um, I had a mortgage with East Devon in 1975. Um, it might help, you know, I, I don't know how feasible it is or how viable it will be um, in these times, but I was just thinking it, it might help um, young people um, acquire homes. And that could be perhaps built into self-build uh, somehow. I don't know. I don't know what's been done in other parts of the country. Um, but I, I think at the time, Chair, you found the idea interesting. Thank you very much, Councillor Rag. We'll just go to Councillor Ingham uh, and then we'll go to Ed Freeman for, for a few answers to the questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think what Councillor Rag was talking about was in, uh, when... Um, there are opportunities for people to get a mortgage to buy um, council houses, certainly in the 80s, I don't know about 75. And the idea being that uh, you, you had that uh, possibility and East Devon used to do that, but that was a different kettle of fish. Now, if I may come back, Chair, that was a private property, had nothing at all to do with the council, just to clarify. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Arnott. Just wondering, uh, Chair, picking up on Councillor Rag's point, which she has mentioned a number of times before, whether one of the recommendations can just slip in a word about officers um, <laughs> exploring financial instruments or some more elegant way of putting that as well. But do you know what I mean? Whether they can also look at whether there's a way in which we can... I like, I almost tempted to ask Councillor Thomas to come forward here because I know he's interested in the area of um, uh, local banks that don't necessarily work. And it's, it's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? But it's it, it might be something worth exploring. I, I just don't know how you put it in a recommendation, really, Chair. Um, anyway. My only issue is I'm not sure if it's if it's linked to this committee uh, and it is a strategic planning issue, um, but happy to defer to Ed Freeman and take some advice there. If, if I may, Chair, yeah. um, I would suggest, no, this isn't the correct forum for discussion about mortgage options or provision of, of, of financial assistance in whatever way. Uh, this is a planning committee or strategic planning committee in relation to planning issues. Chair, I appreciate that, but I just thought I'd throw it in anyway. Thank you very much, Councillor Rack. Appreciated. Councillor Thomas, you muted. It's getting to be a habit. I've done that twice now. Um, I was really just going to pick up on Councillor Arnott's comment very briefly. I think the council will face, uh, in fact, tomorrow evening, some quite interesting choices in relation to setting its budget, not the least that the report specifically then mentions the requirement for significant increases in car park charges that are actually inherent in that. Now, I think that highlights a tone that 
we hit some years ago, but actually that looking forward, we have to seriously look at what actually can we deliver better than a market can. The same approach applies to the housing company, and I've made my views on that, which I know we'll be coming back to. Um, but again, the idea of thinking that we could perhaps, and this is nothing, no, no, I'm sure in, in the 70s, it was probably a good idea, but mortgage market was very different to what it is now, that we could actually do mortgage lending better than a mortgage lender. I don't think we can. And I think similarly, to pick up on Councillor Arnott's specific point about the Southwest Bank, um, I think my view at the time is probably likely to be unchanged. I think that's very diplomatic, but you know what it was. Um, so really, again, I think that, you know, let's, it, we, I'm always, I'm wary on this, and we've done it, do it quite a lot in meetings now, of introducing new subjects into papers that are, into recommendations to papers that are specifically not covered within the, pay, the report to get to the various committees. Just as a personally, I believe that's not a strong practice. Um, but, but again, we perhaps bear that in mind, Chair, and I'm sure Councillor Arnott will pick up on that and, and perhaps incorporate it in his thinking on, in the future, because it, it does make it particularly difficult to come to an objective decision on a recommendation uh, when effectively you've only ever going to have half the story at best. So anyway, thank you for the chance to speak briefly on that. But as I say, I think, you know, it's best that we stick, stick to the core subjects um, and then we'll get through things a lot quicker because I'm going to actually try my go faster button now. Uh, just to check that it does actually work, because I think it's a wonderful thing that that's second only to the teacup button, I think, should be used more often. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Thomas. So, Councillor Davy, subject to the word, well, sorry, Mrs Shaw, can we get some wording off you for Councillor Howell's secondary proposal? You're muted, sorry, Shirley. Thank you, yes. Um, the six elements to the recommendation, it, I would suggest could be research avenues available within the local plan process to deliver fully serviced self-build plots. Fantastic. Councillor Howe, are you happy with that? Yeah, that gives us scope to amend it through the local plan process, which is proper. Councillor Davey. Fantastic. Let's take that to a vote then, committee. Members, as just mentioned, there are six elements to this recommendation. Firstly, to note that 23 individuals were added to the self-build register during the latest monitoring period, 31st of October 19 to 30th of, um, sorry, 31st of, sorry, I'll start again. 31st of October 19, 2019 to the 30th of October 2020. Secondly, to note the need to permission 13 plots suitable for self-build between 31st of October 2020 and 30th of October 2023 to meet the level of demand between the 31st of October 2019 and 30th of October 2020, shown in part one of the self-build register. Thirdly, to note that the demand for self-bid plots indicated on the register should be taken into account in our planning, housing, regeneration and estate functions. Fourthly, to speak with comms department as to opportunities to promote self-build options within the district. Fifthly, the creation of a self-build forum. Sixthly, to research avenues available within the local plan process to deliver fully serviced self-build plots. Members, please press your green tick if you're in support of the motion, press your red cross if you're against the motion, or raise your electronic hand if you're abstaining from the vote. Thank you. For the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And Chair, I have 11 votes for, zero votes against, and zero abstentions. So that is carried. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the last agenda item of today, which is agenda item 12, the East Devon Landscape Character Assessment Minor Amendment. Ed Freeman, over to you for the last time today. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. So um, members will hopefully recall um, the update to the landscape character assessment work that was brought to you at your meeting on the 27th of March 2019, um, which was a refresh of original landscape character assessment work prepared in 2008 uh, under updated guidance that was uh, commissioned and presented to, to the committee. Um, Essentially what's happened since March 2019 is through, through using this work, we've identified uh, a slight discrepancy and amendment needed to that work in relation to uh, the landscape character assessment characterization of work on the Otterton Peninsula, um, effectively land to the southeast of Otterton uh, along the coast near Budley Salterton, uh, well, between Budley Salterton and Sidmouth. Um, and you can uh, see in Appendix A the area that's um, affected, uh, which is shaded in the plan there, shown in uh, sort of orangey pinky colour. Um, and uh, effectively, it's just um, developing a finer grain of information regarding that area in terms of its classification in the landscape character assessment work, which is a key piece of evidence in terms of informing work on, on planning applications uh, and, and also to inform our assessment, assessment of sites that will be coming forward through the HELA and into the, to the local plan process um, to help us to understand their impact on the landscape and um, their visual and impact uh, visual and amenity impact. Um, so it's, it's a relatively minor update to that work, but um, needs members sign off to enable that to be brought into the landscape assessment work. So uh, seeking members authorization to uh, undertake that minor change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. I, I see it, so it's, it is a real minor change and I'm happy just to quickly move that from the chair, unless any member of committee have anything they wish to add. No. So, Mrs. Shaw, can we take that to a vote, please? Yes, Chair. Members, simple uh, motion to approve the minor mapping and description changes to the 2019 East Devon Landscape Character Assessment described in the report. Please in press your red green tick if you're in support of the motion, the red cross if you're against the motion, or raise your electronic hand to indicate you're abstaining from the vote. For the benefit of those watching online, the vote is now taking place. And Chair, we have 11 votes for the proposal, zero votes against and zero abstentions. So again, that is carried. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So that brings our meeting to an end. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone, including all the members of the public watching online for taking part. Can I remind all those present that your comments will be live to the, to the public and until the meeting has been confirmed to be no longer live, they will be live. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, 